Greetings, my fellow Starfleet officers. I am your captain on the deck, Mike the Birdman Dob, but I'm not alone as I trek across the solar system this week. I'm joined by my awesome XO, Steve Megatron Phillips. And the first question you should be asking, where the hell have you been? Well, I don't have a good answer for that, truth be told. Um, Future Imperfect is just one of those shows where e either Steve is really busy because he just bought a house, had a kid, understandably, that's life. Myself, really busy, and at the time of this recording, it is unbearably hot in my studio. So you might be wondering, why does Birdman sound like he's in a Jeffrey's tube? Because I kind of am. I'm actually recording this in my living room on my Xbox One. Isn't technology cool? So we are getting more of these out. Actually, as of this recording, we're recording a couple of these tonight. So you will have some going into July. We do apologize. We're just kind of taking a look at what topics we can easily cover and what topics we can do justice to. Because I know a lot of people have been asking, where is the Cisco episode? And honestly, my personal opinion is... Captain Sisko is one of those people I think that is a lot more complex than what I was prepared to look at. He's one of those guys I don't want to get it wrong because there's so much nuance to the writing of Deep Space Nine. To get it wrong would, to do, the, would, would do the character a great disservice. And so that's kind, of the, that's kind of the show I want to be able to spend a week watching nothing but DS9. And unfortunately, I've been watching a lot of TNG because I just got the episode, or the season six Blu-rays for that, which that'll be a replicator next show, which should be sometime next week. Um, other than that, I guess, Steve, what have you been doing with your time since we last talked? It's been a, more than a month, yes. if not two. I, <laughs> I, just, I just bought a house, so I've been spending most of my time uh, renovating it, more or less, because it's it's a good house, but it's also double the space of our townhouse that we were renting. Mm -hmm. um, as you can tell, I am no longer in a basement with a furnace or air conditioning running. <laughs> um, but uh, we've been going through replacing floors, carpets, um, uh, stairs need to be replaced or repaired, uh, toilets replaced, um, uh, a lot of broken stuff that it's either from the 70s when the house was built or crap that's been neglected over the years. So we're going through and we've repainted damn near every room in the house, um, give or take a couple. Um, pretty much are getting unpacked now. And we've been here since uh, the beginning of May. And uh, then I had no internet for the entire month of May. I think I would have died. I had to use my phone to get our TV shows. Which, thankfully, yeah. I have Sprint, and it has unlimited data, but Sprint sucks for phone calls, so it kind of was a... Win-win? Uh, yeah, it kind of. is a toss-up of garbage. And then I just signed up for Comcast and going through hellacious problems with them now, um, which is nothing new. Uh, and then Geekcast Radio had its year five celebration, uh, June 2nd. So, have you guys picked a winner in your contest yet? Yeah, we actually had four submissions, and all four of them win. Awesome! Yay! So it was it was um, a thanks for paying attention to us. You know, if we would have got more, it probably would have been two people. But um, we figured, eh, what the hell? We'll spread the wealth. Um, Good job. So yeah, it's it's kind of cool. Um, they're they're pretty uh, in depth fans, so they they kind of follow everything we do. So it's it's kind of cool. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of content in the 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 back burner there and uh renovated the website as well so um had a lot going on so here's my question to you before we get into today's topic is your house haunted no damn just because ghosts are cool um <laughs> just thought i'd bring that up just because i can um so guys on today's show for future Impert, which is brought to you by sfi.org starfleet the world's largest star trek online fan club we're going to be talking about space travel. Yes, very exciting stuff. As you saw this past week, um, NASA showed off a design for a new warp ship, which is kind of a concept which has been 
tossed around for a number of years, but back in 2013, when somebody was actually talking about this at a conference, this is the first time we've actually seen what the ship could potentially look like. And it's not exactly a coincidence that it looks kind of like the Enterprise. In fact, this thing is actually called the IXS Enterprise, um, designed by a physicist and a concept artist um, over the well, last little while. There's there's actually a funny aspect about this. And um, do you remember the, the orbital um, first warp ship Enterprise that uh, was before the NXL-1? Of I, Captain Archer? I do not, actually. Um, it's basically, it's it's a ship. Now, it's more like a, a one singular tube that goes in the middle of this, but it's it's got two spheres that go around exactly like this around the ship. However, the ship is much, much smaller, and it's shaped like a needle, like a space needle type thing, almost. Mm-hmm. Um... And it's supposed to be the first warp enterprise that goes like warp one uh, before the NX-01, which goes warp five. Um, So what they've done is essentially they've mixed this orbital ship with the NX-01 with the, the ass end, the rocket end of like, uh, Princess Leia's, you know, rebel ship in Star Wars. Oh, okay, so it kind of looks like the Corellium blockade runner, kind of. Yeah, basically. It looks it looks like that, but it's got, like, the Enterprise front end to it, and then it's got that um, orbital space needle um, dual uh, um, rings around it. Huh. That's kind of fascinating. Now- I, it's, it's taken me all day to kind of... I'm like, I know I've seen some of this before, and I was piecing together the components. Now, the idea behind this episode to you, our audience, is is to kind of talk about space travel. I mean, looking at Star Trek's accomplishments with, like, the slipstream drive, the quantum drive, um, whatever the Borg used to go to warp time, which I think is just slipstream or something similar. Um, But also to look at real-life tech. I mean, this past year or at least within the last couple of years, we've had the first object, Voyager 2, I think, is the first object to exit the solar system, truly to exit the solar system, to go past the helio sheath, to actually get into the interstellar space, the true intergalactic medium, where there's no solar wind or it's at a very minimal influence. And they call it, we're on kind of a magnetic highway, if you will. And NASA thinks they can keep this mission going, but take another 10 years... I think that's how much is left in the battery of this space probe. And the power it's used for this thing is, I think, less than what it takes to run a scientific calculator right now. Just to give you an idea of how much wattage, if you can even call it that, is running through this spacecraft currently. And it takes something like 17 hours plus to send a signal there and to get a signal back. And we're talking ridiculously slow speeds for this stuff to even come in. We're talking bits and bytes, not megabytes or gigabytes, which we can stream down from the ISS and whatever else. No, we're talking bytes. It takes a long time for this shit to come out. And we stand up at, at the cusp of an interesting time in space travel and, you know, basically space exploration as a whole, because space travel, it gets funded and it gets defunded it gets really ambitious, and it gets really pulled back. And it's one of those things where I think humanity needs to start thinking long-term. Because um, we haven't been back to the moon since the 70s. The Chinese are talking about going to the moon very, very soon. Um, I think it was under either the Bush administration or the Obama administration talking about manned missions to Mars sometime in the 2030s or 2020, something like that. And it's interesting just to talk about where we've gone, where we've been. I mean, the space program between Russia and the United States, we've touched down on Mars, we've had probes on Venus, we've sent uh, other probes and other satellites into the atmospheres of Jupiter, we've, sent, we've had probes fly by Uranus, Saturn... Uh, Neptune, 
And there's that famous picture, I think, taken by Voyager 1, uh, which Carl Sagan called the Pale Blue Dot, which is what Earth looks like from, I think, the orbit or close to the orbit of Neptune, I think. I'm probably wrong in that. So Mike at ThisWeekInGeek.net to make fun of me. Um, and it's one of those things where, like I said, humanity's really got to start thinking long term. And with Star Trek, for example, we look at the Enterprise, uh, the NCC-1701, the regular Constellation class ship. We look at all the amenities it has, but we never think about the engineering that would have gone into such a fantastic device. And it's not just things like phasers or photon torpedoes or even the warp drive, which we will talk about, is you have to look at things like the hull. And you might be thinking, well, big deal, it's made out of metal. Well, not exactly. Because in space, there's no such thing as gravity, or at least there are things that affect gravity, but in general, it's zero. But So let's say, for example, Steve, I throw a baseball in space. We can both agree it's not going to stop unless something physically stops it, right? There is no opposing force. No. Okay. Micrometeorites are a very bad fucking thing. And what I mean by that is there are tiny bits of asteroid floating around out in space or dust particles or even more exotic elements flying at these incredible velocities that would chip into the hull. I mean, and I'm honestly surprised an astronaut has not caught a bolt to the face and had their their helmet implode. Because there's actually a documentary on the movie Gravity. And they talk about all the debris that's circling the Earth right now. And in that movie, the idea is there's this cloud of debris circling at like 91,000 miles per hour, some ridiculous number, that's going to kill you. Some of it's fiction, some of it's not. See Neil deGrasse Tyson's thing on it. And when you look at the Enterprise Constellation class ship, it has solved that issue. I find that to be a remarkable feat of not just engineering, because that means they would have had to develop some kind of metallurgy to develop some kind of a new alloy, because I guarantee it, that ain't stainless steel or even titanium. Um, and they even developed ray shielding, which is a term we've heard in Star Wars and Star Trek, to deflect against cosmic rays. And cosmic rays can be anything from X-rays, they can be even other forms of radiation, or even the most dangerous gamma ray bursts, which most likely won't turn you into the Hulk, which will most likely just vaporize you and you're dead. Um, the Star Trek ships have come up with these things to accomplish these great distances that the ships can travel because they're going at these incredible velocities, but they're not having to worry about the dangers of normal space. And that's something that I think Star Trek has done remarkably well is if you read some of the technical manuals, for example, they've actually kind of gone into this talking about, um, it turns out there was one episode of Star Trek where they talk about the navigation shields, which is a, basically there's the shields that go up, which would deflect against phaser fire photons, whatever. Yep. And then there's kinetic shields, which is protecting against micrometeorites. And since we don't have the technology now to generate a laser shield, it just doesn't exist. Star Trek did that first, and there's people trying to develop things like this to protect us against not just micrometeorites and other exotic elements out there in space, but against cosmic rays. One of the things about space flight, even in the solar system that's a big concern right now, is radiation. For example, um, astronauts on the International Space Station have to keep an eye on something that's known as space weather, which you can do the same thing. Google Space Weather, and I think it's called spaceweather.gov, where you can actually watch what's happening on the sun. You might be saying, well, what's the big freaking deal? Well, there's this thing called, um, there are sunspots, and sometimes these things pop, and that generates um, a solar flare. A solar flare can have something that's called a CME, which is called a coronal mass ejection. A piece of the sun or something, or charged particles, fly off the sun and come towards Earth. Generally, it takes a couple days to get here. There's different classifications, but I'll get into that. Or maybe not. It's a little too... Whatever. Um, 
<laughs> point, the point being is, the astronauts inside the ISS, they have to hide from this radiation because if they're out in their spacesuits, for example, they're dead. They are going to fry. Yeah, they don't become the Fantastic Four. Yeah, exactly. Nobody's getting stretchy powers or orange rock skin here. It's just, no. And there actually have been a few instances in space flight where the astronauts have had to hurry their asses up to get protected by this because they don't have the Earth's magnetic shield to protect them. And yet in Star Trek, for example, they can just casually stroll around the ship and don't even have to worry about this. And there's even acceleration effects that could potentially be fatal just because the object is moving so fast. Um, how does one stop going at the speed of light without going through the ship, if you get what I'm saying, like a cartoon? Um, mm-hmm. And the idea behind warp, and I sh- probably don't have to explain this to you people, our audience here, is warp is talking about the idea of folding space behind the ship and in front of the ship to bring two pa- two spaces closer together. Hi, Warp. My wife is walking in. Anyway, um, and the idea is with the warp ship, we could apply the same principles because there are, there is a theory in math that explains this is theoretically possible. We can't do it yet, but the technology is there. They're, they actually do something like this with computing, and it's called quantum computing, if I understand it properly, where everything in the universe, the galaxy, whatever, is all connected at some point. So there's nothing to say stop me, my god, from going to say Galaxy M31, because there's something there that probably connects us. It's like a quantum teleportation sort of thing. They've actually done this with a molecule. They transported that thing like three meters across a lab. So this is possible right now, and I think the applications for this with space travel, probably one, two hundred years to figure this shit out, but... It's incredible just to think that Star Trek, with their vision of the future, that Zephram Cochran in, like, 2061, I think? Something like that. Yeah, it's pretty close. Yeah, or maybe 21. Either way, he figures it out that we can do this, and he catches the attention of the Vulcans. And just being able to achieve Warp 1, Warp 1 is the speed of light, which is, I think, 1,800... 1,000... 100,800 miles per... Something like that. Some really high number. And it's basically like an AU, I think, or something like that. And a light year is the distance light travels in a year. So with that, with space flight, for us to travel to, say, Alpha Centauri, for example, which I think is only like 4.3 light years away, if we travel at the speed of light, it would take us four years. That's also a problem. With space flight, right now, the longest missions I think we've ever had are the ISS and going to the moon. And there's a bunch of logistical problems which Star Trek has solved. For example, food. We've got the replicators. Or in the original Star Trek, we had uh, little food cube things. Basically protein powder. Um, Or astronaut ice cream, if you will. Um, And then you look at other things like water consumption, oxygen. These are all things that will have to be considered in the future. Yet in Star Trek... We have wonderful things like like in Voyager, for example, I think they turned stellar cartography into a, hyd- a hydroponics bay or something. Or they converted uh, Catherine January's private dining room into like a garden or something. I'm pretty sure on, Enter- on the Enterprise D, they had, yeah, they had a, a full botany lab. And the cool thing about this is, too, once again, with Star Trek and Space Flight, is they've even thought about things like recycling wastewater. So every time you go poop and pee in space, they can recycle that. In fact, I think the replica... Thank you, my wife is... I'm not even going to tell you what she's doing. Um, can recycle that material into something usable again. And... I've rambled on enough. <laughs> Feel free to jump in any time here, Steve. Um, and it's one of those things where... I think the more we look to fiction, I think the more we can apply these things into uh, future ideas for space. Because another thing that's actually been considered, too, is entertainment. And that automatically brings up the holodeck from Star Trek. Is this possible? I think I've heard somewhere say, no goddamn way. 
But I think the holodeck is possible. I would wonder. I think you could recreate it virtually, but I don't know whether you'd be able to recreate something right in front of you. Well, they've already figured out how to do teleportation for objects at without losing any any of its um, original coding. See, the thing I, I... I can't remember what... There's a thing in the, the transporter, and it's something... I can't remember what it's called. I want to say it's called the Heisenberg Compensator or something like that. That may just be the Breaking Bad in my back of my head speaking. But, <laughs> but the principle is your objects... The, the molecules in, in your body, your atoms, are always moving. So when you replicate it, how does it know? And that brings up another question for you. Teleportation, the transporter. Is it actually transportation or is it really high-tech murder? Because really think about that for a second. Because it breaks you down. Yeah. I mean, really think about that. You're technically dead in one place, alive in another. And there's actually a character, uh, Reginald Barclay, in Enterprise, or in um, TNG and in Voyager, won't use the transporter. He's got teleportation phobia. And for and you know what? I don't blame him. Well, it's like bones. Yeah, he's like, screw this. <laughs> I completely He's like get having that. my bone, my bones, and my atoms scattered across the galaxy. And what was it that one line? I think it was in yeah, it was in the rebooted Star Trek where they talk about the guy's prized beagle. Like they transported oh, yeah, him Captain halfway Archer's to like a deck or Yeah. So what happened to what happened to him? I don't know. I'll let you when it f- shows up. <laughs> and there's stuff like that, and it's so crazy to think about all this technology that we would de- develop for this. But the point I was trying to make is looking at the holodeck, that's a psychological device. And what I mean by that is they actually, there's been a number of documentaries I've seen on this. If you, let's say you send a guy to Mars, for example, they're actually talking about this now with that huge Mars project. These people need to be entertained. You might be thinking, Oh, big deal. Bring a book. No, How? They're going to be stuck there. Yeah. But this is a one way trip. Likely. More than likely, you're going to die there. But at the same time, how do you keep someone entertained for that long? Because eventually it's going to start to break them down. And if there's a bunch of people living in a close quarters, personality conflicts are going to come up. Yeah. And they have these huge Mars biodomes located in the Arctic or in the desert or wherever to simulate the environments. In fact, one notable movie, which is fucking terrible is Pauly Shore's Biodome. <laughs> I never thought I'd mention Pauly Shore on, on a Star Trek show. Anyway, um, but the idea is you have to observe these people living together. And having a thing like, say, the holodeck allows people to have their fantasy. Then what happens on the holodeck stays on the holodeck if you catch my drift. Because um, that's one of the things, too, because people can go crazy from not being stimulated enough. I mean, you look at people who go to jail, for example, solitary confinement, but in the back of their mind, they know at least they're on Earth. There's other people. If you are billions of miles away from planet Earth, and there's nothing outside that wall between you and the empty vacuum of space, you think about that long enough, you're probably going to go nuts. And that's something that the original Star Trek never really touched on. But TNG was smart enough, too, with, like, Counselor Troy. And every and I thought it was a very progressive step to have the Counselor on the bridge, actually, with Star Trek. Not just because she was a cheerleader in space, but at the same time, for her to monitor the emotional health of Captain Picard. Because... The Galaxy-class starship was meant to be... I think it was the Federation flagship. So the odds of them encountering new people, new alien civilizations, new anything, were really, really high. And for Picard to deal with these stressful situations day in and day out, you have to think about the mental fortitude that these Starfleet people would have to go through. And this applies even now to the space program today. You have to be cleared psychologically to go to space. I mean, Steve, for example, 
Can you just imagine if someone flipped out on, say, the ISS and opened one of the airlocks for fun? Yeah, everybody would be dead. Yeah, I mean, and that's the thing, too. It could happen. And that's really kind of scary, too. And it's kind of funny how a lot of people think space travel is no big deal. But it kind of is. There's so much that, that goes into it that, like I said very early in this discussion, we need to start paying attention to it. Because this planet, and this is not meant to be a kick on the environment or whatever else, take this for what you will. There is no political agenda behind what I'm saying. But resources on this planet are being depleted at a pretty big rate. I mean, oil, uh, natural gas, um, basically, and even nuclear resources are being used up, and it's having an adverse effect on the environment. And the fact that our population, I think, has tripled since the 1800s, that's a lot of mouths to feed. So the idea of colonizing Mars or the moon seems kind of like a good idea. Or maybe even this is another idea. I think even James Cameron and Google are behind this one. So the Terminator dude and, well, Google want to bring an asteroid into Earth's orbit and mine the crap out of it. Um, there was a documentary I was watching this past week, for example, talking about one asteroid could have more gold, silver, platinum, or whatever than the entire Earth combined. Think about that, man. A, an asteroid made of platinum. It's entirely mm. possible. And what other resources we could find on there? And I, I know there's, I think there's like a mineral called iridium or something I think comes from asteroids. It's rare on Earth, but, I know, space. Um, stuff like that. So trying to, trying to develop the technology to leave Earth safely is great. The fact that I said we can get to the moon reliably, there's nothing there, so to speak. I mean, there's, I think they said there's water or there's ice underneath the, underneath the crust or whatever. Not 100% sure of that, so don't quote me on that. But that's a start for at least sustainable human habitat is we need water. I don't know what we do about food. I mean, obviously, we'd have to grow our own and whatnot. But um, going to Mars, the Martian soil, stuff like that. They're even talking about there are these huge, giant craters on Mars with these enormous underground caverns. And they're theorizing right now those may be the best candidates for life right now could be underneath the Martian surface, with the surface being so hostile. Maybe not so much underground. There could even be oxygen down there you don't know. The further down you go, and then there's the Martian ice caps. So, I think... I think we're in a good spot. Now that we know we can leave the solar system, now we just have to decide how, and look at the dangers associated with it. And one of the big things that I don't think a lot, a lot of people realize, and this may be kind of depressing, so follow me here, um, is you look at look at the average human. We live maybe about 70 years, right? If we're lucky. If we're lucky. And they're talking about now, what if biologic life is not meant to leave? And that's depressing, because we've only been around for like 200,000 years or whatever. Our planet's been around for 4.6 billion. And eventually our sun's going to expand into a red giant, and we're going, Earth is bye-bye. Mind you, there's even, they're talking about this because the sun is getting hotter every year. It may not matter, because Earth's oceans may boil away anyway soon, or not soon, but soon in geological terms, like a couple, mil, like a couple hundred million years or something. Either way, um, point of the matter is, what about... We've already sent probes to other planets and out of the solar system. Our legacy may, in fact, be robotic. And there's this one theory that I've heard, once again, where they're talking about if there's intelligent life out there, let's say the universe is 13 billion years old. Let's say that's the baseline. If human life has only developed in the last couple hundred thousand years, our planet's been around for 4.6 billion there's a possibility we may just be really late to the party. 
that life in the universe may have already come and gone. Not likely, but it's possible. And if that's the case, maybe robots and artificial intelligence and other forms of uh, machinery, maybe what we can send out there uh, as our legacy. I mean, one really cool example of this that I can think of, and Steve, you'll follow me on this one for sure, in the cartoon Beast Wars, yep. there's this thing called the Golden Disc. The Golden Disc is Voyager 1's golden record. The record of humanity, the record of human life, DNA, prime numbers, music, sounds, um, like stuff recorded in like 50 different languages or something like that. That may be what's left of humanity at some point. Is that's what we may leave behind is something like that. And I don't think that's a terrible way to end the legacy of humanity. But it's not a great one either. Because I want to see what's out there. I, I think I'd rather have us find out whether there's stuff out there or not. Absolutely. And that's why I'm hoping we take space travel a little bit more seriously. Develop it a little bit quicker if we can. I mean, I'm, I'm all for economic expansion and whatnot. But I'd less I'd like to focus a little bit a little bit less on Chloe Kardashian and a little bit more on say Ganymede or say Titan or Io, which I'm pretty sure are all moons of Jupiter. I know Ganymede is. Um, Titan I think is I wanna say it's Saturn, but I'm not hundred percent sure. Um, and stuff like that, just to see what's out there. Because if this warp ship that's being proposed would work. The sky's the limit. I mean, if we can develop the technology to move, then we just have to develop the technology to make sure we get there and aren't dead. Like shielding, um, food, psychological issues. There's so much out there in the universe to see. I mean, with radio telescopes discovering new phenomena all the time to see these galaxy clusters where there's like hundreds of thousands of stars packed into like 120 light years or to see um, a wolf rayet star which is this incredibly rare type of star that eats another one and shoots off gamma ray bursts. Probably don't want to see that but it would look really cool. Um, stuff like, stuff we've only theorized about like quark stars or you know seeing a pulsar or you know being able to see what a galaxy looks like from outside of it. I mean, there's so much in space that is yet to be discovered that we have yet to even scratch the surface upon. And with um, the Kepler array or the, the Kepler telescope finding a super Earth, I think it's only like 13 light years away from here. There's possibilities for life out there. I mean, if we can find a good planet that has oxygen on it and water... Well, that's half the equation. Now we just have to hurry. Now we just have to hope the, the, the biology of that planet doesn't kill us. And that's something else that Star Trek kind of never addresses, or at least addresses not so often. Well, I think it started out addressing part of that, but then I think as it progressed, I think it kind of forgot. Well, yeah, because you'd see Bones, or you'd see the holographic doctor occasionally giving someone an inoculation to go down to a planet saying, hey, by the way, don't touch this. Um, stuff like that, because you think about the human body is evolved to survive on Earth. Let's say we go to Earth 2, the common cold out on that planet may be as devastating as AIDS here. We don't know. And that's something else that I think space travel, we haven't taken into consideration yet, that our bodies are going to have to change. We're going to have to develop either new technology, genetic manipulation, or something that hasn't even been thought of yet. And that's exciting, too, to think we could even have offshoots of humanity out there. And, you know, it's not outside the realm of possibility, when you really think about it, to have another planet that kind of looks like us. Primates. Yeah? Yeah, I mean, it's not, it's not unlikely. That's another thing exciting too about space about space travel is we we've talked we've kind of touched upon this talking about life out there how did life develop on, on other planets how did it develop like for example if they've got a different star than ours they may not see the same wavelengths 
that we see. They may not even have eyes at all. Or they may have developed past the need for verbal speech. Literal telepathy. Because in theory, it's just another form. Thoughts are just another chemical reaction. Who's to say it couldn't, another species couldn't read that somehow, some way? It may be a biology we don't understand. And I know we've talked a lot about this, about the what ifs. But looking back at what we've accomplished in this 40 years, 50 years of space travel is astounding. When Sputnik 1 circled the Earth, sent that first signal, launched the space race. Look at all the computer technology that's come out of that. Look at all the consumer goods that have come out of that. And it's it's kind it's really kind of amazing when you look back and think about how much we depend upon space and it doesn't need us, but we need it. Well, unfortunately, the sad thing is is we haven't really done anything worthwhile since the 60s. I mean, we have, but we haven't. Yeah, there's been technological advances, but nothing super groundbreaking. Well, they've never actually tried to get out of here. And I wonder why that is. I, I really mean, do. If, well, I mean, if you've been to the moon before, why not go back? Why not try and build a uh, uh, some kind of a moon station there? Yeah, I mean, it does raise interesting questions, and I'm sure there's some dark conspiracy theorists writing us an email right now as to why we've never gone back. And I would like to know the answers to those questions. Unfortunately, I don't think your administration currently or ever will ever answer that question until such and such a time. You're, yeah, because they lie. Yeah, I mean, you're right, though. Why haven't we gone back? I mean, sure, we sent spirits... An opportunity in the big Mars rover a couple years ago to Mars. That's cool. But we just kind of left the moon alone. The moon is something we can do in a matter of days. Well, the thing I don't get is I, I know that Mars is pretty much a one-way trip for whoever goes. But my my thing is, is if you can build, if you can get to the moon, why not build an establishment there? And then, you know, you could build a, a spaceship there without the constraints of gravity hitting it. Yeah. And send it off to Mars with fuel in it, ready to go. Yeah, uh, and I think someone had proposed the idea to use the moon as like a space station to fling stuff at Mars because it would speed up the trip by like a couple of months. Yeah, it doesn't make sense why they wouldn't do this. However, though, did you know that asteroids and meteorites, I forget what the difference is between the two, so sue me, um, actually hit the lunar surface more often than you might think? Really? Yeah, I didn't know. There was a video I show. I mentioned this on Nerd News a couple months ago, but something hit the moon, made this gigantic flash, and it was something like two or three times the Hiroshima blast released of energy. Because there's no atmosphere on the moon, so there's nothing to slow it down. So I could see maybe why they're a little hesitant in that regard, but they could build it underground or something. There's nothing saying, hey, let's build a giant 7-Eleven on the moon. But, you know, there's stuff that they could do, or stuff in lunar orbit. Stuff like that. There's so many possibilities as to why. Because I think round trip to the moon is like three days. Every, anybody can survive three days. Um, well, yeah. So... You're right, though. It raises interesting questions. Why we've never gone back? Or why haven't we done more detailed explorations of, say, Venus? Obviously, it's a hostile environment. Actually, the hottest planet in the solar system, due to the greenhouse effect, and incredibly hostile, but it's terrestrial. In fact, some people have even talked about the idea of terraforming Venus, which is yeah, a really cool idea. I don't idea. know if we're ready for a Genesis project yet. Yeah, I don't see that happening. But you never know. And that's something else, too. Terraform and talking about that as well. Um, the idea is, for those of you that don't aren't familiar with this term, and I'm sure 95% of you are, terraforming is taking a planet that's maybe inhospitable to life now and changing it over generations, hundreds if not thousands of years, to make it more friendly towards life. And 
there's nothing that says we can't do it. We just don't know how yet. Um, like changing the content of the atmosphere to produce more oxygen and less nitrogen, for example. Maybe there's a process that can do that. Um, it's incredibly fascinating stuff when you really look at the history of space exploration and how Star Trek has really opened up the doors for this. I mean, seeing worlds there. I mean, one of the most interesting episodes of Voyager that I saw was this planet that exists outside of time just a little bit. Like, time on that planet passes incredibly fast because it has a really fast rotation or something. Maybe there are planets like that out there. I'm kind of doubting it, but yeah, you never know. Or, like, say, Star Wars. You see planets like Hoth, the giant ice planet. I know in Star Trek there's classifications of worlds. Worlds that we want are Class M planets. We like that. Class L, I think, is tolerable, but it's a, an ammonia-based atmosphere or something. Um, yeah. I've talked about this an incredibly long time. Um, trying to think, what else can I really say? I mean, Star Trek is the space vehicles I want to see us get into. I'd love to be able to cruise around in the Enterprise without fear of gamma ray bursts ending my trip or bouncing too close to a supernova or having been killed by a marble in space. Or even figuring out how to make a shuttlecraft that we can stop ripping up places to make roads and you can just fly these cars uh, or shuttles across all over the place. Yeah, and that's something else too that's, uh, that's happening now. We're actually developing suborbital flights for commercials. So we are getting closer to the shuttle craft in terms of being able to move you from one corner of the Earth to the other really fast. They've even talked about things like skyhooks or the, basically these giant space elevators. The, the technology is there. We just have to build it and take a chance. And I think humanity will get there someday. Like I said, if we can focus a little less on Justin Bieber, a little bit more on Kepler, I think we're going to see something really cool happen. And hopefully within our lifetimes, and seeing this guy come up with the concept of the warp ship, saying it is possible, here's how, but how do we do it? It's fascinating stuff to me. So that's about all I've got for this episode. Anyway, Steve, any other thoughts out of you? Because I think I've talked for ninety nine percent of this. Uh, no, I mean I think I think we pretty much summed it up in in the episode. But it's it's definitely something to look forward to to finally see NASA doing something different. Uh, they they kind of you know seeing them retire and put on hold all. Uh, other projects that they had going and, and try and actually do something new. Um, you know, like, like creating this, this new enterprise or, or make, trying to make it out of the, you know, uh, out of our, our planetary orbit for once. Yeah. I mean, I want to see what's out there. I'm excited to see what's out there. And Maybe we're going to, maybe we're on the cusp of some new scientific era. And I really hope we are. And I really hope what we find out there is friendly. But we're going to have to wait. I and hope see. so as well. And, and, and you know what? That's a topic for a different show where we can talk about alien conspiracies. Because, hey, aliens happen in Star Trek. Funny how they all have the weird, have weird shaped ears or shit on their faces. So I have yet to see a squid person, but I will. So I guess that's pretty much going to do it for this edition of Future Imperfect. Next time on the show, we're going to talk about the fandom. In our first episode, me and Steve talked about we were excited to be Star Trek fans. There's conventions, there's podcasts, there's all this sorts of cool shit. 25 episodes later, is the excitement still there? I guess we'll have to wait and find out. So until next time, we have been... Steve Megatron Phillips. And I've been Mike at the Birdman Dodd saying... Live long and prosper.